Welcome, all of you, to the 2017 induction for the Hall of Fame for Leaders and Legends of the Blindness Field. We have two wonderful inductees today, and we're kind of going to, kind of going to get right into it. But before we start, if you would join me in a moment of silence for the Hall of Famers who are no longer with us and those members of our field who may not be with us this year. Thank you, folks. Lost some good ones over the last few years, haven't we? Uh, what I would like to do is make this a celebration today. Sometimes we get a little too solemn and somber. So are you guys ready to celebrate? <laughs> yeah, I hope I can do it. All right, sure. All right, so everybody stand up. <laughs> We'll make this quick. Okay, everybody turn to the right. <laughs> As Janie says, your other right. Okay, now find the shoulders of the person in front of you. Come on, Craig, you can be my partner. All right, now this is not a group massage. I want you to do something for yourselves that you very rarely do. You guys work so hard. So what I want you to do is, Craig, you wanna flip flop with me here? Okay, flip flop, let's do it the other direction. Thanks, Craig. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all. If you don't get anything else out of this today, <laughs> remember that you need to stop and pat your friends on the back because they work hard every day. All of you do. And if you do something really great and nobody notices, have you noticed you could reach your hand right over your shoulder? Reach your hand right over your shoulder and give yourself a pat. All right, real quickly do a brief history of the hall. Uh, this all started back in the late 90s where a couple of, uh, I'll call them heretics, <laughs> uh, or you can call them interested professionals, that's always better, isn't it? But heretics kind of fits too. Four guys named John Maxson, Rod Kosick, Mike Nelipovich, and Dean Tuttle decided that we weren't paying enough attention to our history. And so they compiled a list of what they considered to be the 32 heroes of our field. And in Denver in the year 2000, they unveiled those folks and they highlighted all, the, the, all their accomplishments. It was a wonderful presentation. Uh, what they didn't know is there were people listening and thought, well, you know, that might make a Hall of Fame. People might really like to know this history and be able to access it on an ongoing basis. And the head uh, culprit is sitting right at this table here. His name is Bob Brasher, and uh, who just would not let it go. <laughs> and <laughs> that's right. And Bob gathered to him another group of heretics, and I'll call these heretics dreamers. And they're people like Janie Blome and Mary Nell McLennan, and Tuck Tinsley, and Don Keefe, and Gary Mudd. He's somewhere in here. <laughs> I'm looking right at him. Bert Boyer, Alice Garrett, Paul Zirkelin, and Will Evans. And it started. And they enlisted some other folks like Kay Holbrook and some incredible writers and movers and shakers, and all of a sudden, folks, it happened. Uh, APH has been very kind to the Hall of Fame. Uh, APH put out the initial monies to, to put the Hall of Fame together, uh, as well as donated the space. But what Tuck Tinsley always wanted people to know, and Bob and all the rest of us, is that the Hall does not belong to APH. It belongs to the field, to the entire field. And without our support, folks, it will die. So you and I are the ones who keep the Hall of Fame going. 
Uh, isn't it nice that we have our history preserved? Isn't it nice that we know those folks who came before us and what they, what they meant to us? Uh, if you haven't been to the hall, you need to go because there's all kinds of wonderful things in there. You'll see the plaques and the kiosks for all of the, uh, the, our heroes. A fellow named Andrew Dakin is the one who does those bas-relief plaques, and he does a beautiful job. And you're probably going to wonder who wrote all the words for these people in the biography of our, our web page. And there are actually lots of folks who did that. In fact, the two people up here on the dais with me wrote the biographies for, for, biographies for our two inductees today. Uh, but the initial 48 uh, were a couple named Tuttle. You may know them. Dean and Naomi. And Dean's picture, make, well, it was up just a little while ago as one of our inductees. So I guess the last thing for introductory comments, you need to know who the governing board of the Hall of Fame is. And uh, some of them are here, and if I call your name and you happen to be here, uh, stand. And if you're not, please don't. Uh, Greg Goodrich is our chair. First, the officer. Greg Goodrich is our chair. He, he is formerly of California and now of New Jersey. Marge Kaiser from South Dakota, <laughs> our secretary. Ann Wadsworth from BC, our treasurer. And the members, George Zimmerman from Florida, Roseanne Silverman from New York, B.J. Lejeune from Mississippi, Gary, I've already mentioned, Gary Budd from Kentucky, Jim Deramick from Maryland, Francis Mary DeAndrea from Pennsylvania, Janie Blome is the curator of the museum, and I am the immediate past chair. Folks, this is my swan song. I go off the board <laughs> at the end of this year. You're supposed to say, oh. <laughs> it actually feels pretty good. It is so wonderful to be retired, I can't tell you. So, you know, when you're retired, you can choose what trouble you get into. All right, let's, let's start with our inductees so you can get a chance to know them. And we're ready for that first slide, Scott, wherever. So let's see. We have, we're going to skip this, uh, this PowerPoint for the time being and go straight to Robert J. Smith. This. I guess I can... There he be, Bob Smith this himself. <laughs> when I entered the rehab field years ago, they showed us a film and Bob was speaking on it. And all of a sudden I understood the worth of rehab. And basically what he said was, I, I could be receiving public assistance and this is what I would make. But I have a job, and I pay that much in taxes every month. So rehab, it's kind of a double question, right? And all of a sudden, I began to see the worth. And then the studies began to say out and said that something like eight to $10 for every dollar spent in rehabilitation is returned to the economy. That ought to sell everybody, don't you think? These days especially, I think. Let's talk about Bob. Carl Augusto once said, there have been two giant role models for the deaf-blind person over the last century, Helen Keller and Bob Smithus. Bob was born in Brentwood, Pennsylvania, part of the Pittsburgh metro area, and at age five he contracted something called cerebrospinal meningitis, and as a result he lost vision and hearing. He began his education at Western Pennsylvania School in Pittsburgh, and then at 16, he enrolled in Perkins, and we're ready for that first slide. And here he is with his graduating class at Perkins, graduated in 1945. Uh, Bob said that it was one of his fellow students there who convinced him he needed to go on to college. I think it might be that guy on the left. What do you think? Not sure. Okay. Well, he did go on to college, and... Uh, he said his greatest challenge was graduating with honors from St. John's University from Brooklyn. And here's the next slide. Here he is surrounded by his family on graduation day. For a time, they thought he might be the very first deafblind person to graduate from college after Helen Keller. But uh, David has told me that there were actually quite a few others that uh, were kind of incognito, I guess, for a while. But after he graduated from St. John's, then let's go ahead and do the next slide. 
Three years later, he got his master's from NYU. Again, one of the first deafblind people to do so. And now the next slide. After he graduated uh, from, actually from St. John's, he went to work at this place called the Industrial Home for the Blind. And that was when Bob came into doing something that all of us know him for. There probably was never a better advocate for blind persons or deaf blind persons. This guy was an incredible speaker. He spoke with confidence from the heart. And as we were, John mentioned this as we were talking at the table, he came across not as an expert, but as a regular guy, a guy everybody could relate to. And as a result, he accomplished some incredible things. One of them in the 60s, 62, I believe, was the Ann Sullivan Macy Services uh, Act, or program. And the Ann Sullivan Macy Services program was a five-year program that demonstrated that given quality rehab services provided by highly trained personnel, deaf-blind people could indeed acquire the skills to work in a variety of careers and live independently. That program was an incredible success, as you probably already knew it would be. But because of his success, both as an advocate and as an administrator, let's go ahead and get the next slide. Uh, that was his advocacy slide. Sorry, I, 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 I would have slide short. One more. <laughs> Here we go. Because of his advocacy, he received the Handicapped American of the Year Award that was uh, from the President Lyndon B. Johnson's Committee on Employment of People Who Are Disabled. And this is not Lyndon B. Johnson. Those of you who are uh, no political <laughs> science, you know that that's Hubert Humphrey up there. And you'll also know that, uh, notice that uh, Bob has his thumb on Hubert Humphrey's lips and his fingers spread out along his cheek. This is a method called Todoma method of which Bob was a master. And is taught at Perkins still as I understand, is that correct? But even after receiving the Handicapped Person of the Year Award, Bob knew there were still things to do. He continued to advocate along with others. Uh, one of them you may remember, her name was Helen Keller. She's in the Hall of Fame, I recall. And from that advocacy came this. In 1967, Helen Keller National Center was born because of the advocacy of Bob Smithus and others, but it was the powerful advocacy of Bob that really made it come true. The f <laughs> found a funny thing in here. Tells you how humble this guy was. He said, yeah, we argued for a decade for a place like Keller Center, but it took a rubella outbreak in 62 and 63 to make it happen. Sad kind of treatise, isn't it? How how tragedy always seems to benefit our field, and yet sometimes it's, it's what gets the thing done. I choose to believe that a lot of this, uh, there may have been a rubella outbreak, but a whole lot of this was Bob Smithus. Bob was also a talented writer. We can go ahead and do the next slide. And this is shows uh, these are the covers of, of his autobiography called Life at My Fingertips and Nat Sent News, of which he was the editor. The power that these two... That, that his articles in Nat Sent News and his autobiography had with deafblind persons in general, many of whom were not sure they su could succeed until they read this book. And the articles that he wrote in Nat Sent News not only Im impacted deafblind persons, but also their families uh, to show them more or less different kinds of ways that they could help and support their deafblind members. Uh, I didn't put a copy of his poetry book, but uh, ah, here we go. At your table, you, you saw this poetry book. In, in that, Bob was, wrote several volumes of poetry, and in 1960-61, he, he was named Poet, Poet of the Year by the Poetry Society of America. Michelle wanted to honor this, and so she put together a collection of his poems, and actually it was David here who edited the whole thing and put the whole thing together. And thanks to the Helen Keller Center and Michelle Smith, this, all of you got a copy. Now there may be, there were just a few short, right, Janie? So, but, but not to worry, there'll be a, a list if you would like a copy of this book and you did not get it, okay? Also, I have an extra up here if somebody would like one. 
uh, then uh, by all means, let me know and also let Janie know. But it's a great book. Maybe, let's go ahead and do the next slide. I bet you all recognize this person. <laughs> I can't look at her and not think Baba Wawa. Sorry. <laughs> Old Saturday Night Live hangover. <laughs> I love this woman. She's one of the greatest interviewers who ever lived. Of course, it's Barbara Walters, and in uh, 98, she interviewed uh, Bob and, and Michelle, and this is what she said. She said, when I, I'm asked who are the most memorable people I've interviewed over these many years, I do not name presidents or kings, but rather the late Bob Smithus and his wife, Michelle which tells you something about them. Some of you may have seen the 60-minute piece. If you didn't and you want to see some clips of it, Bob has put up some video of it on our website, so by all means, go and take a look. David also did something else, by the way, and it's just this uh, bookmark that goes with it, honoring Bob's uh, induction into the Hall of Fame. And finally, I'll close uh, this portion of it by by, with these words from David. And he says... Dr. Robert J. Smith does forever change the landscape for people who are deafblind. His work made it an undisputed given that with proper training, deafblind people are able to support themselves and participate in the mutual give and take as full members of society. To accept on behalf of Robert Smith, this David Goldstein is here. Uh, David is the director of the National Resource Center for Blind Musicians. Not a musician himself, but he's been in the national and international scene of our field, running a summer institute for blind college-bound musicians that was held for many years at the Overbrook School for the Blind. You also might remember him from the 80s and 90s when he was the editor of Versa News uh, that talked about refreshable Braille uh, technology. Bob got to know... Uh, David got to know Bob when he was a student at Helen Keller Center. Uh, Before I forget and before I turn the mic over to David, uh, Michelle is the one and the Helen Keller Center are the ones who made sure we got these books. We owe them a really debt for that. I think we need to give them a big applause, don't you? David says Michelle is eagerly awaiting this video, so a shout out for Michelle. Michelle. Woo! All right. And ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Goldstein. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, everyone. By the time I met Bob, he was weary of honors. He had received four honorary doctoral degrees and scores of awards and shaken hands with at least five presidents. I know he would have appreciated this induction because it goes along with advice he wrote in a poem. The poem is called The Measure of a Man. Measure yourself in the mirror of men's souls. For if they praise you with sincerity, it reflects the gathered glory of your own, harvested from your words and thoughts and deeds. Life is a gift to be shared spontaneously. And like an echo, it returns to us a hundredfold what we have given freely from its inexhaustible source. Life is a gift. He truly believed that, despite what he called the twists and churns. He was curious to know what others around him were doing, eager to try new things, to make the most of each moment. His career of service to deafblind people was for 60 years. He counseled students. He wrote, traveled, and educated the public. Sometimes one does his work so quietly and well that it becomes part of the fabric 
and people forget how things were before. Bayek was a pioneer with the unusual notion that people with disabilities wanted to live a normal life. He wanted to get up and go to work. He wanted to shop and cook and have friends over for coffee. His advocacy, example, and the personal effects he had on others have made it possible for generations of deafblind people to take it for granted that they can have a job or live in an apartment and know that there are resources ready to help. He was also the one to say that independent living and job training were not enough. The most important part of living was to be included, to have companionship. He wrote, there must always be that bond of true personal interest that promises the assurance that one is really wanted, not merely tolerated. He read magazines on every subject so he could have a conversation with anyone about anything. He really wanted to be interesting to people. One thing he had read about but not had a chance to try was a slot machine until one day he was in an airport between flights and he said to his guide, you know, I'd really like to try a slot machine. And his guide said, I don't think we have time, Bob. And Bob said, well, I'd just like to try. Can I put one nickel in? Said, oh, OK. So he put the nickel in, and the bell started ringing. <laughs> and Bob made the jackpot on his very first nickel. That was the, <laughs> that was the kind of luck he had. He also had the shrewdness to plan strategy. He was very good at playing the stock market. And he always did things that people would tell him were impossible for somebody who was deafblind. And it wasn't like he wanted to prove that a deafblind person could do anything, but he, he loved to take on these challenges and prove people wrong. There are many stories. Uh, the beginning of this one may not be a good example for ex officio trustees. 20 years into his career, Bob and a much younger student bumped into each other in a dark hallway. Her name was Michelle Craig. They started talking and talking and pretty soon, people noticed that they were spending a lot of time with each other. And soon, they weren't even showing up at lunch. <laughs> Bob's hobbies, um, many hobbies, was gourmet cooking. And so Michelle was getting treated to lunch that was much better than the institutional food. Uh, but as you can imagine, Bob's supervisor was not thrilled about this. He took him into his office and read him the riot act. Bob stood calmly through the whole tirade. And when he finally stopped, Bob said, I wouldn't worry. We're getting married. And Michelle will tell you, it was love at first bump. <laughs> Bob's lectures ended with a question and answer period. Someone inevitably would ask, do you have children? And Bob's standard answer was, not that I know of. But I think that in actuality, his poems were his children. Like his work, the poems had faded into the background. Bob and Michelle asked me to help them to see what could be done to get them republished. 
The first order of business was finding them all. I was asked to find five pamphlets which the Industrial Home for the Blind had produced in the 1950s and given as Christmas gifts to donors. And I thought I would never find these things. I looked on the internet and found one in the library of the University of Virginia. And then I discovered that all five of them were in the Miguel Library at the American Printing House. And so I want to thank the blindness field for such, taking such good care of their colleagues' writings. This project has taken three years, and all along there have been coincidences and connections and friendships made. Just one coincidence, the printer that a friend of a friend recommended turned out to be the son of the man who printed one of Bob's original books. I never thought I would be corresponding with Barbara Walters or be here. The first page of the book you have says that the poems are easy to understand, so I don't think I have to tell you too much about them, except that from them you will learn a lot about Bob, about deaf blindness and life, and that you don't need sight and hearing to know beauty. Uh, I think the picture that's on the screen is the one of Bob fishing. <laughs> All right, well, now we can show that slide. <laughs> I always wanted to say next slide, please. <laughs> So now that we have the picture of fishing, I thought I'd read you Bob's poem, Fishing. When April comes with sun and rain and churns this earth to spring again, I take my rod and bait my hook beside some willow-shaded brook reached by a half-forgotten lane. And there, forgetful of life's strain of men who bicker and complain, I sit in a sequestered nook when April comes. What though the trout should overlook the rules I've garnered from a book? The joys of fishing still remain. A heart that's light, a mind that's sane, whether or not there's fish to cook when April comes. Thank you. Got the most important part, David. <laughs> Come on up and join me here. Big can of water is going to fall on my head. <laughs> uh, this is the plaque for, for Robert J. Smith that it will go into the Hall of Fame, and I'm presenting it to you now. So you want to hold it up and show the crowd out front there? Here you go. Well, it's a little heavy, isn't it? Then Andrew Day can do good work. <laughs> Thanks, David. partner. Doesn't it feel good to honor people like that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, now let me see if I can find my place. <laughs> Our next inductee is William Bell Waite. And we can go ahead and put the slide up for him, guys. There he is. One of the things I like most about William Bell Waite is that mustache. <laughs> they really grew how to grow mustaches back then, didn't they? 
I mean, you can't see any lip at all. It's just wonderful. In Texas, we call those food strainers. But William, William knew how to grow, grow them. He was a very determined man in many, many, many ways. And we're going to look at him now in more depth. Let's go ahead and take the first slide. William Bell Waite was born in a town called Amsterdam in 1830s. And it looked very much like this. Uh, you can see there is a definite Dutch influence to these buildings. And that's the community that he, that he grew up in. But he didn't go to school there. Let's go ahead and do the next slide. Amsterdam is not that far from the capital of New York called a little place called Albany. You guys may know that place. And this is a picture of Albany right about the mid-1800s. Mid that's uh, the old exchange building on the right. He did his grade school there. He also went to college there. And immediately after college, he went to work for this place. The next slide. You may recognize this place the New York Institute for the Education of the Blind. He was a teacher there from 1859 to 1861. Uh, is, is this building still around, Bernadette? No, actually, where that building is, if you've ever been to uh, Manhattan, is across the street from Penn Station. It was from uh, 31st Street to 32nd Street between 9th and 10th Avenues. They occupied that whole block. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So d days gone by then. Right. Well, he, he, was, he was a teacher there from 59 to 61, but he didn't have enough, so he came back. He took a small sojourn to fight in the Civil War <laughs> and uh, to study law and pass the bar and also to be a superintendent of another school. He did all this in two years. Guy, guy was a mover and a shaker for sure, right? And then he came back as principal to the New York uh, school for the Ed Institute for the Education of the Blind, and he would maintain that position until 1905 when he retired. Are you adding up these years yet? <laughs> okay, and after he retired, he was appointed principal emeritus, and he was a principal emeritus until his death in 1916. If you add that all up, that's over a half century of service this guy put in. So an amazing commitment in the uh, 1860s, he saw a demonstration of this stuff called Braille. Some of you may have heard of that. <laughs> and he was pretty impressed with it, but this is characteristic, so characteristic of William Bell Wade. He took one look at it, he thought, well, I can do something better. <laughs> I can improve on this. And so he invented New York Point. And go ahead and give us the next slide. And this is what New York Point looks like. I don't know how well you can see this chart. But if you'll notice, it's kind of sideways Braille. It's four characters, or four dots long, right? And two are wi in width, and two in depth. <laughs> My favorite quote about to New York Point is from Helen Keller. Helen Keller did not particularly like New York Point. She said it hurt her fingers. <laughs> but to me, it looks like a fairly simple and easy system. And I was kind of impressed that he came up with this system. He would be an advocate of it for the rest of his life. And the interesting thing is it became widely used all across the United States, especially in schools for the blind. Almost all of them adopted it. And it was considered the standard for the last quarter of the 1800s. Very, very popular system. Of course, we know in the 1930s it went a different direction. But for its time, New York Point gained lots of, con of converts. Okay. But he wasn't content with that, so he in introduced New York Point in the 18, early 1870s. In 1872, he came up with something called tangible musical notation, which was point for music, right? And he still wasn't happy. <laughs> he still thought there were things he could do, and uh, he was spurred on from this because in the early 1890s, he saw another demonstration, and this was of Mr. Hall's Braille Rider. And he thought, well, if New York Point is to succeed, then we've got to have a, a writer for New York Point. And so, next slide, he invited, invented this. It's called the Clydograph. That is substantial. Be pretty hard to put in your backpack, wouldn't it? <laughs> but at the same time, look at how well that thing is made. I mean, it's all steel, and the, and the board, the, the reading board there looks like a, 
uh, teak. It looks pretty heavy. But at the same time, it was a way to write, write a tangible system of writing and reading. So you'd think maybe that would be the place to stop, right? Well, his next concern was people need stuff to read if this New York Point's going to go. And so he invented this next thing, next slide. This is called a stereograph. The stereograph embraced, embraced, embossed <laughs> metal or brass plates, and the plates were used for book printing. Okay? He couldn't stop there either, so he invented a printing press to use the book plate on, and he invented a system where he could print on both sides of the paper. The guy was a, a, a thinker and a guy, a mover and a shaker. He just did not leave anything alone. So what did he get for all this? Let's go to the next slide. He got several awards. He got medals at the Chilean and International Expositions, our World's Fair, as well as this, the prestigious John Scott Medal from the Franklin Institute. That's what a Franklin Medal looks like with Big Ben on the top. So you know he invented, you know that he was persistent in, in, in all of his endeavors. What you don't know are some of the other things probably that he accomplished that, it, uh, that have affected, well actually the inventions affected us all, but this in particular. He was also a person who, who was, what's the word? He believed in professionalism. He believed in spirituality. And because he believed in professionalism, he co-founded an organization called the American Association of Instructors for the Blind, AAIB, a forerunner of our current AER. And go ahead and let's show the next slide. I forgot to tell, show you, to tell you about all the books that he wrote in support of, of, uh, of uh, New York Point, but in New York Point and also Tangible Musical Notation. One more slide. Okay. This is the, if Justin Gardner, Justin, are you still out there somewhere? Justin found this photo for me. I could not find a picture of an AAIB meeting. I thought there must be hundreds of them out there. This is an AAIB meeting held in Little Rock. Guys? <laughs> Where's that Little Rock contingent? <laughs> All right. <laughs> held in Little Rock in 1910, okay? Now, I want you to look closely at this picture. William Waite is in this picture. Justin doesn't even know this. I had to look it over to find him. But look at the pillar on the far left, okay? Do you see that guy standing in front of the brick pillar on the far left, the mustachioed guy? That is William Waite right there, folks. And if you look in front of the other pillar, there's a guy with another mustache there, and uh, that is Bill Daughtry. <laughs> so, little, little known fact. And if you look in the second row here all the way to the left, you'll see Tuck Tinsley standing tall over there. These guys are older than you thought. <laughs> it may not be grape juice they're drinking. Oh, no, sorry. That was bad. One step too far, right, Gary? <laughs> I was just so pleased to find this. The other organization he co-founded was called the Society for Providing Evangelical Religious Literature for the Blind. He supported both of these organizations to the day he died. So, William Waite, innovative, visionary leader who passionately sought and promoted advances in technology as well as greater professionalism for practitioners and never ceased trying to improve circumstances and opportunities for blind persons. The guy was a forward thinker and he always moved towards improvement. Here's what his niece had to say, say about him. By the way, his niece became a teacher of the blind. And he, she said, Hannah Babcock, he was a man who having carefully weighted the right and wrong of every question coming to him, determined upon his course, and with untiring and unflinching energy went forward unmindful of all opposition. Toward his friends, he bestowed unlimited generosity and brotherly kindness. And toward those who honestly differed from him, he was ever tolerant. Made an impression with his knees, didn't he? <laughs> and with the rest of us, too. Uh, by the way, the AAIB meetings were so much, William Waite was so powerful in those meetings that they began to call them Waite's con conventions. <laughs> I thought that was an interesting tidbit. Here to accept 
in William Wade's honor, Dr. Bernadette Kappen, who is the executive director of the New York Institute for Special Education, board member of the Vision Serve Alliance and vice president of DeafBlind International. Help me welcome Bernadette. Thanks so much to everyone on the committee for selecting uh, Mr. Waite. I'm really so proud to be able to accept the award on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the New York Institute, the students, and the staff. Mr. Waite was inspirational during his career and continues to motivate professionals in the field to always look for ways to improve the lives of individuals who are visually impaired. I think Billy gave you some great ideas of what he's been able to do during his career. His focus on literacy and his development of New York Point provided access to many. Mr. Waite was truly an entrepreneur. He developed machines to produce New York Point and thought about developing machines where individuals could both read and write at the same time. The Institute is one of the oldest schools for the blind and was able to offer, even at that time, professional development for the staff. Waite knew that this was important for professionals to have an opportunity to network with each other. And this was long before networking was even popular. His efforts to bring people together lives on today through AER. And his desire to improve access to books and materials is where APH got its roots. An amazing man when you think of the time that he lived and all that he was able to accomplish. And we talked a little bit about advocacy this morning, I'm sure that he had many obstacles that he had to overcome to be able to do what he did for the, uh, the children around the country. Everyone at the Institute benefits from his outstanding career. Being a part of the Leaders and Legends continues to help honor a great man. Hearing about him inspires us to do great things for the children and adults that we care about. He was a believer, a dreamer, and was always on a daring adventure. He could never be missed in a crowd, and Billy already stole my line here, that he was famous for his mustache when you look in the pictures. And any old pictures that we have of him at the school, he always had unusual mustaches. A quote that I think captures his spirit from an unknown author. I was given a poster when I worked at the Institute years ago, when I left there to go to Overbrook, and it's always been a favorite quote. There are two things in this world that we can give to our children. One is roots, and the other is wings. He lived this every day. Thank you so much for selecting Mr. Waite. And on behalf of William Waite <laughs> and the Hall of Fame, Bernadette, this is William Waite's uh, bar relief plaque. Thank so you, you want to so hold much. it up for the group here? There you go. <laughs> and for those who couldn't see his mustache, you can come up and see it on the relief. It's a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bernadette. Uh, wow. Uh, let's go ahead and do that last PowerPoint, the one small stone of activism. I'll be, be as quick as I can with this. This is a poem by Alice, well, it's a statement by Alice Walker, if you're an Alice Walker fan. And uh, first slide. It has become common, a common feeling, I believe, as we have watched our heroes falling over the years, that our own small stone of activism which might not seem to measure up to the rugged boulders of heroism we have so admired is a paltry offering toward the building of an edifice of hope. Many who believe this choose to withhold their offerings out of shame. This is the tragedy of our world. For we can do nothing substantial towards changing our course on the planet, a destructive one, without rousing ourselves, individual by individual, and bringing our small, imperfect stones to the pile. 
Sometimes our stones are, to us, misshapen, odd. Their color seems off. Their singing, comical and strange. Presenting them, we perceive our own imperfect nakedness. But also, paradoxically, the wholeness, the rightness of it. In the collective vulnerability of presence, we learn not to be afraid. Even the smallest stone glistens with tears. Yes, but also from the light of being seen and loved for simply being there. I like that last photo, don't you? Okay. The wall of tribute. I want you to look around this room now. And I want you to think of all the people here you have learned from. Find somebody who was there to listen to your woes when the day just didn't go real well. They're going to be people, folks, who never get one of these bas-relief plaques. A lot of us in this room, no doubt. And there are also going to be some who do get bas-relief plaques. But Kay said it so beautifully last night. We're all in this together. You all work hard. Our contributions differ from day to day, but they're still just as much as all the others. What was it Helen Keller said that uh, progress is made by the big pushes of the heroes, but also by the gentle pushes of you and I, all the rest of us. It takes all of us to do this. So in thinking about that and looking around this room and seeing the people who've affected you, like the two we've just talked about, Think about getting a stone for that person. You want them to be honored, put their stone up there. Tell them you really like them. I say this for two reasons. One is because I think it, it's what we need to do. We need to pat each other on the back. We need to honor each other. And the other is because the money from these things goes to the maintenance of the hall. <laughs> okay, there's a little selfishness in there. <laughs> At the same time, I'm brought to tears almost every time I walk in there and read that wall because there are folks up there who did, it might have been one thing on one day, but it made the difference in whether I kept coming back or not, you know? So those folks. All right, so one last, and this is for Michelle's benefit. I think we need to do a standing ovation for these two inductees and just roar as loud as we can. Maybe she'll hear us in Colorado. You guys ready? All right, let's do it. Ha, 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 ha.